in comparing the objectivist epistemology to um, Kant's epistemology, it seems to me like they have very similar structures. Like there's a perceiver, there's what's perceived, and then there's a means of perception in between them. Mm -hmm. But then that's different from like, say, George Berkeley, who's like a pure subjectivist or, mm -hmm. or other philosophers who have different structures. So would you be able to say that Rand's and Kant's epistemologies are structurally the same, but the difference lies in the emphasis that Kant basically comes up with a pessimistic conclusion that, well, you know, since, since there's a means of perception in between, that we'll never know the world in itself. Whereas Rand says, well, yes, there's, there's a means of perception with which we perceive the world, but that's great. Like, it doesn't matter that, you know, it's, it could be different. Like, some, somebody could see a color differently or things like that. So, first of all, for Kant, from Kant's perspective, and again, we should keep in mind there are different interpretations of Kant and questions about whether we have him right. But from Kant's perspective, it's not a pessimistic conclusion, right? So it, Kant thinks of his conclusion as, as great in two respects, right? One respect is that it, enables us to have a priori knowledge, he thinks. It shows how we could have a priori knowledge about certain aspects of the physical world, which he thinks is necessary to ground science. So he thinks we have to have a priori knowledge in order for there to be science. There must be some kind of way to get this a priori knowledge. And my theory explains how it's possible and therefore how science can be on a firm foundation. And that's a win for him. And it also means that we can't have any knowledge of certain things that it would be scary to have knowledge about because the kind of knowledge we might have about them might go against the kind of things that we feel very strongly we need to believe about ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, namely that we have free will, that there's a God who's judging us and will reward us for following our duty in the afterlife, that we, there is going to be an afterlife, and, and that there's, if you go to the third critique kind of stuff, that there's some kind of greater meaning and purpose to everything. So it preserves lack of knowledge where there's a very strong pragmatic for Kant and emotional need for meaning where any kind of knowledge he has, he thinks we could have would prevent us from having that kind of meaning that we lead to life. So the skepticism is a plus for him. And then it, it gets rid of skepticism about the kind of limited domains in which he thinks science is applicable and so puts science on a firm foundation. So I don't think Kant thinks of it as a cynical or or, or negative conclusion at all. He thinks this is great. I've, I've found out how to get everything I want. I can have my faith in my morality and I can have, you know, uh, um, uh, Newton and Euclid. Right. So um, I, I think it's important to understand in Kant that he's very pleased with this. He's not, you know, damn it, if only I could get through to the end of the world. Um, second, I do think there's something right about noticing some kind of structural parallels or similarities between Rand and Kant. They're on about similar issues. And to be really different from someone, um, you have to have certain similarities with them. Otherwise, you're not even talking about the same thing. I mean, you know, uh, someone's opposite and anything is going to be somebody who's got a lot in common with them, such that they're able to be opposed on, you know, they're, they're on about the same issue. So I do think there are structural commonalities, and they're kind of interesting ones. But I don't think it's right to say that um, for Rand, the means of perception is in between the perceiver and the object. You use that language a few times. And I, I think that makes it, it, it sound too Kantian. The way I, I think of um, the way I think of it, so here I, I'm holding a harmonica, right? And there's a way I'm holding the harmonica. Now I'm holding it a different way, and now I'm holding it another way, and now I'm holding it a third way. You can see all these different ways I'm holding it. And there's no such thing as just holding it, and I'm not holding it anyway. It would fall. To be holding it, I've got to hold it in some way. Mm -hmm. But we don't say that my way of holding it is something in between me and it so that I'm really grasping my holding of it and not it, but I'm grasping it through my holding of it. The in-between language just doesn't make sense. There's no between. There's, to hold something is to hold it in some way. And the way is in something between the you and the holding it, and that maybe what you're really holding is the way. Well, likewise, to hold something with your mind, to perceive it, to see it, to get it, to grasp it, to understand it, is to understand it, perceive it, grasp it, get it, etc., in some way. And the metaphor of that way as an intermediate or something in between is, is 
I think, very misleading. The, the, there's no physical grasp that doesn't have any identity. And the identity, whichever particular grip I have on it, isn't something between the grasp and the object. It's the nature of grasping the object. Likewise, there's no conscious grasp that has no identity. And the identity is something, isn't something in between the grasp and the object. It's the identity of the grasp of the object. And there is a kind of pervasive tendency in the history of thought. And it's not something that, you know, unique or distinctive to Kant. It was around way before him and persists way after him. He just has a certain particular take on it um, that, that treats awareness as though it had to have no nature. And so any nature it has then starts to seem like something that's intervening in between you and the awareness. And I think the whole trick to understanding uh, consciousness and ran through consciousness is to challenge that premise and think of it more like I was illustrating with the grasp. 